Thank you everyone for coming to this year's Green Amendment Day, where we will be learning and enjoying the success of the Green Amendment environmental rights protection. As of late, you might have heard national news generating about the use of a Green Amendment by youth activists in Montana. That's one of our three Green Amendment states, the other two being Pennsylvania and most recently New York. We are watching our youth knowing and exercising their constitutional rights for themselves and future generations, fighting in the courts for a healthy environment. Because of the Green Amendment in their state, these youth leaders have been able to have their voices heard over exploitative industries that place profits over people. And we hear their wishes loud and clear throughout the nation. In states where we are fighting for Green Amendments, we can see the fear from the other side. Why? Because we know granting people the rights to a healthy environment, to clean water, to clean air, to clean soil, to a healthy environment gives us the power and health to do best by our neighbors, our communities, and most importantly, to make sure that elected officials at all levels of government, from municipal to states, and soon on a federal level, do right by us and allow us to exist in a world with drinkable water, breathable air, and to enjoy a healthy environment like those who came before us. Today, we will be hearing from leaders in the Green Amendments Movement and Environmental Protections who will make this case. I, Nicole Maestas Olanovich, not only support the Green Amendment here in my home state of New Mexico, but I sit on the board of directors on a national level because I support the Green Amendment in every state. And I firmly believe it should be embedded into our United States Constitution. If you haven't read the second edition of Maya's book, then let me tell you a little bit about myself. I lived the consequences of exposure to environmental toxins from serving my country in Iraq 2004 downwind of burn pits for 12 hours a day at the ripe old age of 19. Now 38 and a first time mother, I do not know a life without the consequences of breathing issues, health issues, and the everlasting impacts of my right to breathe clean air being taken away from me. I currently live in a sacrifice zone that amplifies the harm already done to my body with toxic water and polluted air that violates federal regulations on more days than not out of the year. I do not wish this on my daughter or even a mortal enemy, much less the innocence of future generations. It's my duty and my honor to tell my story as much as possible to ensure we see the outcomes and prevent further damage. And that's why we need a Green Amendment. With that, I wanna thank everybody for coming today, participating in this conversation. And if you haven't already, go ahead and put your name and organization or where you're coming from into the chat and sit back and let's learn about enjoying the successes of the Green Amendment and our right to environmental protection. And now it's my honor to turn our attention to my fellow New Mexican environmental champion, earth protector and board member, Harry Sloan for our land acknowledgement. Thank you, Nicole. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And also thank you for that wonderful welcome. You laid out exactly what we need to know and understand about the Green Amendment. And thank you for that. My name is Terry Sloan. I am Dene and Hopi, born of the Ikea Ani, born for the Atod Lini. And my Hopi grandfather's clan is the Fire Clan. I'm also a board member of the Green Amendments, which Nicole just mentioned. And I'm also the, the director of my NGO, Southwest Native Cultures, uh, for which I'm an accredited member of the United Nations. Heck, the picture behind me. <laughs> um, now I'd like to present to you our land acknowledgement. In this group, we acknowledge that we are on land of the first people of this nation. And in this group, we acknowledge that we have a responsibility to be part of repairing the harms done to all indigenous people that have experienced systemic oppression and harm. And in fact, we have a responsibility to all persons who have experienced systematic oppression. Now I'd like to briefly tell you why I am a board member and I have supported the Green Amendment. Um, and I've worked and fought hard to protect Mother Earth for over 25 years. 
And when I first met with and heard Maya tell me about the Green Amendment and its purpose to create through a state's constitution, our constitutional right to clean air, clean land and clean sacred water, also a human right. I was in after the first five minutes of her presentation. And since then, it has been almost four years now, has been my honor and my pleasure and privilege to be a part of the Green Amendments for the generations. Now I'd like to turn, over th th turn things over to Maya Van Rossum and Melissa Martin will be co-hosting today's program. And we'll see if she'll convince you in five minutes to join the Green Amendments. Uh, yeah, Kwakwai, thank you. Okay, that's me. Um, good evening. My name is Melissa Martin. I'm a Florida attorney and have been volunteering in support of the Florida Right to Clean Water Initiative. I'm a native Floridian and I've um, had a career as a Marine Corps judge advocate. After retiring in 2014, I almost immediately became active, very active in my community on issues of good governance, um, clean water, and conservation. I, I did what I could on various fronts uh, to include teaching a couple of classes at my alma mater, Bear University School of Law, uh, teaching uh, water pollution law and environmental ethics as an adjunct law pro professor. So um, very quickly, my, my personal statement of why I support Green Amendments um, and this movement and why it means so much to me is that uh, beyond my soul level love and connection with nature. I'm also a, a systems person. I, I look at the, the overall broad picture of how things work, where things go wrong. Um, this is why I believe that the environmental issues go hand in hand with good government, good government and issues of ethics and, uh, and things like that. So um, after studying years, uh, these, these issues, I've come to the conclusion that this is really the only way. This is the way if, if we, as a community, as a region, as a state, as a nation, want to achieve the level of legal balance and everything that comes with it, we have to get green amendments everywhere very quickly. So um, with that, I'll go ahead and introduce the agenda for the evening. Um, we're going to describe what is a green amendment? What does that mean? Uh, and after everyone understands what, what we're dealing with today, the status of the National Green um, uh, Amendment movement is something that we should all understand so we know uh, where we are and where we, we need to go. And then finally, uh, not finally, but how have green amendments brought change? We are going to step through very uh, important cases in the states that have been uh, that have had green amendments according to the criteria and definition of green amendment. And that would be Pennsylvania, Montana, and New York. Um, and that is how and why our uh, panel of experts are going to be presenting their, um, their thoughts and explanations of not only what these cases said or did, but what it means. And it points, the spoiler alert, it <laughs> they all point to the not only benefit and value of green amendments, but the dire need for them. And then finally, a uh, Q&A discussion we'll be holding at the end as robust as we, can, as we have time for. And um, so I won't belabor any moment of this presentation. So I'm gonna hand it back to um, Green Amendments founder, Maya, and um, co-host to tonight's event. Oh, there we go. So thank you so much, Mel. I really am looking forward to co-hosting um, today's National Green Amendments Day. It's actually the third annual National Green Amendments Day event that we are, ha that we are having. And I'm looking forward to co-hosting it with you, Melissa, an incredible leader in the Green Amendment movement, particularly in Florida, but also helping nationwide. And I wanna thank Nicole and Terry for those beautiful opening words and thank them for their tremendous leadership in helping to advance the Green Amendment movement within their states where they're incredibly involved, but also on the national level. They, they worked tirelessly as do other Green Amendments 
um, for the Generations Board members, you know, worked tire tirelessly to really help us advance this cause. Before I introduce myself, I do want to acknowledge that behind the scenes, we have Bridget, we have Molly, we have Annika, and we have Peter, um, who really have been so crucial to making today happen and this actual event happen. And so lest I get to the end of the program and I forget to extend my gratitude, I thought that I would extend it up front. And so with that, um, hopefully most of you know, but if not, um, my name is Maya Van Rossum. I am the founder of the Green Amendments for the Generations organization and movement. I wrote the book, The Green Amendment, the second edi edition just out. Um, but I really founded this movement as a result of my 30 years of work as an environmental activist and attorney working as the Delaware Riverkeeper and leading a four state advocacy and litigation organization known as the Delaware Riverkeeper Network, an organization I still lead today while I at the same time help lead the Green Amendments for the Generations movement. Um, so it really is truly an honor to do this work. And so many of you in the audience, right, have, I've had the honor of working with as key partners in advancing the Green Amendment movement in your states, in Washington, in Florida, in Hawaii, so many states I see um, represented in, um, in the chat and in the program. I recognize many of the names. So, you know, as you've heard, right, today we're really going to answer the question. Does having a constitutional green amendment really make a difference? That's the question I get asked all the time when I go into a community, no matter how long I've been working there. And of course, my answer to that question is yes, absolutely. And I, you know, really try to help express and explain how and why and give examples. But of course, everybody's probably thinking, yeah, Maya, we knew you were going to say yes. And so that is really the beauty of today's program. The today's program is not going to be Maya trying to convince you that having a constitutional green amendment really does make transformational change um, once it is secured. But you are going to be hearing from a number of leaders, environmental lawyers and leaders who have been using the Green Amendments in their states, working with the Green Amendments in their states, and really experiencing and witnessing firsthand the powerful difference that they see Green Amendments having in the three states where they already exist. Again, Pennsylvania, Montana, and New York actually secured in that order. But, um, you know, we, we thought it was really important, as, as we've done every year, to really quickly go over and make sure that we're all on the same page about what a Green Amendment is. And I think we first really have to start with terminology. People always hear me say Green Amendment. Very rarely will you hear me say Environmental Rights Amendment. And that's because a green amendment is a certain kind of environmental rights amendment. The fact of the matter is almost every state constitution across our nation talks about the environment. Many have environmental rights amendments, but there are only three states, Pennsylvania, Montana, and New York, which lift up environmental rights. So they are given highest constitutional standing recognition and protection and actually recognize and protect environmental rights on par with other fundamental rights we hold dear, things like the right to free speech, freedom of religion, private property rights. And so a green amendment is a kind of environmental rights amendment. Every green amendment is an environmental rights amendment, but not every environmental rights amendment is a green amendment and has the same kind of powerful transformational um, um, strength um, that a green amendment has. So what are the key criteria that make an environmental rights amendment a green amendment? Well, first and foremost, it has to be placed in the Bill of Rights section of the Constitution. Some states call it the Declaration of Rights section. It's usually Article I or Article II, but it's right up there, Bill of Rights or Declaration of Rights. That is where we recognize and protect the other human, civil, and political rights we hold dear. Um, and that placement gives special extra protection, recognition, and power for the fundamental rights that are acknowledged there. If we want our environmental rights to be protected as powerfully as these other fundamental rights, we have to place them in that same section of the Constitution. We have to be clear in the language of the amendment that we are protecting the rights of all people, 
and that we are protecting the essentials of the environment that are critical to the health and safety of, of our lives. Things like clean air, clean water, a safe climate, healthy flora, fauna, ecosystems, and environments. With the language we choose, coupled with the Bill of Rights placement, it is essential that we ensure that the environmental rights of all people that are acknowledged and protected are protected equitably, regardless of race, ethnicity, or socioeconomics. That critical equitable protection cannot, must not be undermined in any way by the language we seek and secure. With a green amendment, right, the language again, coupled with the Bill of Rights placement must be applicable to all government officials from the local town council to the state legislature to the governor's office and every other governmental entity and body um, in between, the attorney general's office, right, the Department of Environmental Protection, any and all of them must be subject to the obligations that are found um, in the green amendment language. It's not just that the state legislature has all the power. All government officials have the power and the obligation to ensure that environmental rights and natural resources are protected. The language must be self-executing, meaning that it is enforceable in its own right. You don't have to find a piece of legislation that actually makes the amendment enforceable. We look to the plain language of the amendment, the right of the people to clean and healthy water, air, safe climate, healthy e ecosystems and environments. We can look to that plain language for strength and protection and enforceability when we need it. It's not dependent on legislation. And you're actually gonna hear some of our speakers really emphasize that very effectively. The language must be enforceable by the people. That is critical. And it can't just be aspirational language that sounds good. Um, we actually have to, again, through the choice of words and through the Bill of Rights placement, there has to be enforceability of the entitlements and the freedoms and the obligations that are recognized in the Green Amendment language. Now, those are some of the essentials that must be in, uh, part of an amendment in order for it to qualify as a green amendment and ensure that we are lifting up environmental rights and giving them that highest constitutional standing recognition and protection. But there are other value added provisions that really help strength, strengthen the rights and the obligations that are articulated in the green amendment. So I'm just gonna list a few of those. First off, having generational language, being clear that we are protecting the rights of present and future generations is very, very helpful. First off, it lets our youth know that we care about them, right? And that we really are looking to protect natural resources and environmental rights for them and their future, even if they haven't been born yet. And that's powerful and that's important. But in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, where we have clear generational language, we have also proven that this obligation to protect natural resources and environmental rights for present and future generations is not just aspirational language. It is substantive. It is meaningful. It is enforceable. Um, we might want to lay out certain extra qualities of the environment that we want to make sure we are being clear that we are protecting through this environmental rights amendment, um, through this green amendment, not just the environmental rights amendment, this environmental rights amendment, that's a green amendment, the human health values of the environment, perhaps the cultural values of a clean and healthy environment, cultural values to Native American communities and indigenous communities where there is a special connection and power um, in the essential qualities of a healthy environment. Perhaps we want to recognize that we're protecting the retro recreational values of the environment, and there are other options, but there are, these can be very helpful in guiding the interpretation and the application of the amendment. And we want to um, lay out, it's very valuable to lay out that the state actually has an obligation to serve as the trustee of the natural resources of the state with an obligation to protect those natural resources for the benefit primarily of the people, including present and future generations, and that the people are the beneficiaries of this natural resources trust that has been 
set up. This really brings into play another body of law, trust law, that really helps clarify the duties and the obligations of government officials when it comes, it comes to natural resources protection, ensures that they recognize that they must prioritize protecting natural resources for the benefit of the people, not for the profits of industry or personal political motives. And you're gonna hear John Smith, actually one of our speakers, talk a little bit more about the value of this trustee language, which actually exists in Pennsylvania's Green Amendment. When we have these kinds of um, elements in a provision, we transform a, just a, an environmental rights amendment that, that may be great language, but not might may not make the kind of powerful difference that the people were hoping for. It transforms it into a green amendment, which really can bring transformational change, strengthening the law, but also empowering the people to better protect the environments that are so essential to all of our lives. Right now, the Green Amendment, we have Green Amendments, as you've heard a couple of times, in three states already, Pennsylvania, Montana, and the state of New York. But we also have actual language that's been proposed in 14 other states, and we're anticipating language in the near future in the state of Michigan. So we've got 15 other states that are in play. If you're in one of those states, hopefully you'll get involved in what's happening there. And if your state's not shown on this map, maybe you'll be the leader that will reach out to me at Green Amendments for the Generations and we'll work together and with others to make it happen. Um, if you wanna learn about, you know, more about the Green Amendment movement, not, um, find resources about what it means and how it works and how you can get involved, what states are active and how to connect with activists there. Of course, we have a website for thegenerations.org. But we also have a new action app that we're really just been getting underway in the last couple of months. This is a social media platform that is all Green Amendments all the time. And there is a national community, but there's also a community for each of the states that are most active. And so we really are encouraging people to sign up for the Action App. It's not, uh, it's just now getting up and running. So there's some activity there, but you're gonna see more and more activity, particularly as we go into the fall, when people are anticipating upcoming legislative sessions where Green Amendment proposals are going to be moving forth. And of course, in the state of Florida, where the Green Amendment is advancing by citizen petition, um, you can find out right Right away how you can get involved and help collect the critical signatures necessary for the Florida Green Amendment. If you sign up for the Action App, whether you've already signed up or you're signing up anew, we actually have created four cool new stickers and you can get one for free. And when you go onto the app, you'll find the sign up form to get this little gift of gratitude for being part of the Green Amendment movement. Or of course you can get the book. And starting today and for the next week, we have a special hefty discount on the book, um, The Green Amendment, The People's Fight for a Clean, Safe and Healthy Environment. The book includes the stories of why we need a Green Amendment, stories of real people like Nicole Alonovich, um, about why we need a Green Amendment, how people are going about getting a Green Amendment, and some of the stories about how Green Amendments are bringing transformational change, some of which are gonna hear a little bit about today. I do want to, before we move on, I do want to answer a question that I always hear, like, how are you guys funded, right? Are you, you know, people want to know, are we getting money from big business? No, we're not. We're funded by grants and donations. So community support is really critical to us. And we were really honored this past year to be um, accepted into the 1% for the Planet program as um, an environmental uh, member. And so with that, I'm going to turn it back to Mel so she can talk about how we're going to go forth and see how green amendments have brought beneficial change to the communities or the states where they exist already. So, Mel? Thank you, Maya. Um, okay, so now Maya and I are going to be taking turns introducing our expert panelists who are able to provide uh, pre recorded uh, overviews and explanations of various cases pieces uh, critical to these analyses. Um, as, we, uh, as we step through each of the uh, three states that have green amendments, as, as you know, um, please take note of any questions you might have. We'll have time to answer about one or two live after each presentation um, before moving on to the next. And again, we're gonna have a, as much um, Q&A as possible at the end of this. And regarding the Q&A that's going on uh, uh, right now, um, I'm going to try to answer as much as possible uh, while the next video is going to be uh, played. And, you know, anything that I, I don't miss or I miss or, you know, we don't get live, we will 
we will try to uh, take care of later on. So with that, Maya is going to be introducing John. So John Smith is actually um, a, a, a founder partner of a private law firm called Smith and Butts, but they are a firm that, that does really important work working at the municipal level and often taking on um, community, um, representing community members and environmental organizations in addressing critical issues very significantly uh, often in the arena of oil and gas. Um, and John, as you're gonna hear, was a key leader and litigator in the landmark case, which for me is what launched it all in terms of the founding of the Green Amendments for the Generations Movement. Hi, everybody. My name is John Smith, and I'm an attorney in Washington County, Pennsylvania. And I've been asked today to speak with you briefly about Article 1, Section 27 of the Pennsylvania Constitution, which is our Pennsylvania Environmental Rights Amendment, as well as a case that went to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Um, I am involved with the Delaware River Keepers, and so everybody knows, I argued this case before the Supreme Court way back in 2012. Now, I've had the occasion to speak about this case numerous times over the years, and understand for today, we're just gonna give you a general overview in five to seven minutes about some of the significant findings from that case. If we could just put our slide up. And as a beginning, Article 1, Section 27 was added to the Pennsylvania Constitution in 1971. But for over 40 years, it languished in the courts and the courts weakened the language within it. It wasn't until 2011 when the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania legislature passed an oil and gas act that basically allowed fracking in the Commonwealth in every single zoning district throughout every local municipality. At that point in time, I represented um, seven municipalities along with other council, along with a number of individuals, including Maya Van Rossum and one environmental group stepped up to help us. And that was the Delaware Riverkeeper Network. Now, what was important about the Delaware Riverkeeper Network and, and Maya Van Rossum was, that we had various um, arguments that we were going to advance to challenge this statute. And they insisted upon challenging it under the Environmental Rights Amendment, Article 1, Section 27. And if we could just turn the slide, um, for those of you unfamiliar with it, um, the people have a right to clean air, pure water, and to the preservation of the natural, scenic, and historic aesthetic values in the environment. Now it goes on to say about trustee obligations and that the Pennsylvania government acts as a trustee. This is a provision that is found in Article 1, Section 27, as I mentioned, but Article 1 is Pennsylvania's Declaration of Rights. And why that is important is that those are our equivalent to our Bill of Rights. What the court found that if it is in Article 1, that these are rights inherent in man's nature rather than created by the Constitution. So basically, these are rights that we already have as citizens, and the Constitution is just recognized in that in Article 1. So moving forward on to the next slide, um, there's a brief explanation about the obligations that governments have and that how they have to act in terms of the environmental effects and the obligation exists, regardless if there's any statute in place. Now, oftentimes people wrongfully looked at this um, for over 40 years and found that, well, this is just a policy type constitutional amendment. It is not. It was an actual literal type that gave people the acknowledged right of clean air and pure water. And so within this, the court in the Robinson Township Delaware Riverkeeper case struck down numerous provisions of a Pennsylvania statute that allowed drilling and fracking to take place throughout the Commonwealth and looked at the plain language of the um, constitutional amendment. Think of it like the First Amendment. We don't need, in First Amendment world, we do not need a statute to say we have the right to free speech. We look at the literal language of the Constitution. That is the equivalent of Article 1, Section 27. The court looked at the literal words of the right to clean air and pure water, meaning that it's self-effectuating, that you don't need any additional assistance from other statutes to allow for 
the provisions to be in place. So the court struck down in utilizing Article One, Section 27, getting rid of years about precedent. It was a landmark decision. And it also provided trustee language. We can turn the slide for a second. The court looked at uh, the trustee responsibilities, not just the rights for clean air and pure water, but the trustee obligations from a constitutional standpoint, that two rights, one, a right to make sure that actions of the government don't violate environmental rights. And secondly, that the government itself as a trustee, when we think of trustee typically in, in states and wills, but same thought that as the trustee, the government has the obligation to enact legislation to protect those rights. Now, lost in all of this, and when people look at this and um, say, well, we have clean air laws and we have different environmental statutes in place, that may be, but that does not negate this constitutional right. In fact, we had environmental statutes in place during the Delaware Riverkeepers case that did not fulfill their obligation. The statute didn't speak about proximity to drilling and proximity to people's homes. So think of it, for instance, that there are certain air permits required when you meet a certain threshold of volatile organic compounds that may come off a site. So there's a certain tonnage that are allowed to come off a site before you need a permit. Well, we don't aggregate uses. So if you had a number of different well sites around a school, for instance, the, our Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection was not going to regulate that. But the argument advance was this violates the constitution. So even though it may comply with the statute, that doesn't mean the rights to clean air and pure water are not going to be affected such that people's constitutional rights are in place. This is absolutely essential that you have this constitutional amendment as a fallback to any wayward government action. In fact, in 1971, the constitutional amendment was passed in reaction to governments allowing forest, foresting throughout Pennsylvania, coal mining, the destruction of rivers, all under the guise of, of ordinances and statutes are in place to protect. But the reason I put this slide up is that what the courts found is that, and what people take issue with at times, well, if we have this, it means we can't do anything. If we have a right to clean air and pure water in our constitution, then it limits our right to do anything. And that's not what the Pennsylvania Supreme Court held. In the Pennsylvania Supreme Court decision written by a conservative Republican chief justice, also um, the municipalities that advanced this case along with the Delaware Riverkeepers and the individuals were mostly Republicans. And they recognized that the right to clean air and pure water didn't stop economic development. It just made sure that economic development would take place once you looked at the environmental potential and environmental problems such that you can minimize the reaction. If you could turn to the last slide. So basically as the court held, the duties to conserve and maintain are tempered by le for legitimate development tending to improve upon the lot of Pennsylvania. So what the court found here is that even though the government has trustee responsibilities, and they have to make sure things happen, economic activity can move forward at the same time. So if you're going to set up a building or a um, smokestack, you're going to meet certain requirements. You're going to look at things beyond statutory requirements to make sure that it will not affect the ultimate rights of these citizens. So in this short period of time, what we've learned is that an environmental rights amendment is essential that the Robinson Delaware Riverkeepers case for the first time in Pennsylvania after 40 years of being weakened by the lower courts was now strengthened and the true language of clean air and pure water is what was in place and is what is utilized going forward. The Supreme Court was a plurality decision. And lastly, the PEDF case, which followed the Robinson Delaware Riverkeepers case adopted it in total. So now we have a majority decision and it has changed the landscape. It changed the fact that drilling cannot take place throughout Pennsylvania and all local governments had the ability and the obligation to regulate environmental issues that came before them. All a result of individuals and people having a constitutional amendment in place and utilizing it, getting a court to accept the true terms of what it was written.
Thank you very much for listening. Okay, Mel. So we've got a couple of questions. Um, so uh, I was thinking that I could answer the first one about language, and maybe you want to answer the last one from Sophia. Okay, sounds good. So the um, anonymous attendee says, are the three current green amendments, New York, PA, Montana, worded differently? Uh, and yes, they are. Um, they are quite distinct and quite different, but they all fulfill those critical criteria in terms of Bill of Rights placement and being self-executing, being focused on the essential qualities of the environment. Pennsylvania has that critical trustee language. Pennsylvania and Montana have generational language, but New York does it, doesn't. They, they all do it a little bit differently. And actually, Green Amend all of the Green Amendment proposals that have been put forth in the 15 states where there's active efforts happening, in those states, the language is different as well. And that really is by design. In fact, when somebody reaches out to myself and Green Amendments for the Generations wanting to advance the movement, one of the early things we do together is work on what is the right language for that state. Um, and that language has to fulfill some of the key criteria of the law, but also it has to make sure that we're honoring the different personalities of the people who are involved, of the state itself, the different cultures in that state, the different priorities in that state, you know, the, 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 the different goals or priorities when it comes to environmental protections and natural resources. So as long as we fulfill the criteria and get that highest level of protection, that's what's essential. But it really is very important that when a Green Amendment is crafted, it is crafted by the people of that state in a way that gives them ownership of that language. And as a result, they will be the best champions and advocates for it when the time comes to um, educate others on it and try to get folks involved and try to get it passed. So great question. Okay, so the question I have from Sophia is, can green amendments be used to argue for statewide divestment from fossil fuels and other harmful sectors? Yes, any action or policy of inaction that the government is responsible for and is doing or should be doing is gain um, because that's the nature of a fundamental, fundamental right, which is a right against the intrusion or, or invasion of you know, what the government does against us as humans, as citizens, you know, who want to live our lives, right? So over time, the, the line has shifted on various issues, but on the issue of the environment, we're pushing back saying, okay, you can no longer do this because it's ruining my future, my present, my kids' futures, et cetera. And so absolutely, the I believe, and I'm not gonna steal too much of my own thunder, but the Montana case, the youth plaintiffs um, had this as part of their uh, complaints um, that the state of Montana was doing things that um, it shouldn't be doing uh, by way of fossil fuel investment and, and things like that. So yes, the green amendments can be used to start the necessary transition that has been talked about at great lengths, but not, <laughs> not a lot to show for it. Okay, so um, I think we're gonna go back to the next presenter at this point in time. And I think I have the honor of introducing Professor Katrina Q, uh, Halb Distinguished Professor of Environmental Law at Pace University. And I understand that in her presentation, she's gonna be uh, introducing herself as well. So I won't delay it any longer. Um, let's just say impressive. So <laughs> let's go ahead with the video. Hi, my name is Katrina Q. I'm the Hab Distinguished Professor of Environmental Law at the Elizabeth Hab School of Law at Pace University. I'm excited to be here today to think a little bit about the value of green amendments. I was very involved in New York's effort to adopt a green amendment. One of the states we looked to for inspiration was Montana because Montana has wonderful green amendment in its constitution. So I'm going to focus today on thinking about the value of the green amendment. I'm looking at two cases side by side. Uh, that have been brought to enforce Montana's uh, green, uh, green Amendment. So what I'll start with is the language of Montana's Green Amendment, which begins with some very broad language about the fundamental right to a clean and healthful environment, and then goes in uh, to some more detail. 
In terms of thinking about the value of Montana's Green Amendment, what I'd like to focus on as a value, there are many values of a Green Amendment, what I'd like to focus on coming out of these two cases and examples is the way that a Green Amendment can provide a tool to citizens to protect their environment, even when the legislature makes bad decisions. And here I think of it almost in terms of Superman and kryptonite. A Green Amendment is like kryptonite. Um, oftentimes what the legislature says in a state is the final word, it's game over. When there's a Green Amendment, there's at least an additional question raised about whether what the legislature has chosen to do satisfies the constitutional requirements uh, of to protect uh, to protect the environment. The first case I want to talk about um, fails from ooh, 25 years ago now, maybe 1999. Um, and it was a case involving a proposal to build a large um, cyanide leach gold mine. And the mine was proposed to be built in an area of the world that is just spectacular. Um, so it was um, designated to be built where the Landers Fork feeds into the Blackfoot River. This was, of course, immortalized in Norman McLean's A River Runs um, Through It. And it's actually, if you go back and look at um, Lewis and Clark's journals, you can see a description of almost the exact place the mine would have been built. It's described as, quote, the right-hand side through handsome plain bottoms to the foot of the ridge. It was marked then and is marked still today with a series of rock cairns that were built by the Salish tribe that, of course, were there long before uh, Lewis, Lewis walked through. So the mining company here, in order to construct its acid leach gold mine, needed to do some, as part of its exploration plan, some pump tests. And those pump tests involved taking um, groundwater from the bedrock aquifer and pumping it up uh, into the shallow aquifers of the Blackfoot and Rinders Fork rivers. Unfortunately, it was discovered um, that there were, um, that groundwater was discovered to contain levels of certain constituents, including most notably the carcinogen arsenic um, at levels high above applicable water quality standards. Now, normally in Montana, Montana has a statute on the books um, that requires something called non-degradation review. If that requires, if there is going to be a degradation of a high quality water, like the waters at issue here, there needs to be very strict study of it and a very express evaluation of whether whatever it is that's being proposed to be due, that's being proposed to be done that could, will cause that degradation, is it really worth it? Is there any other way to do it that we can avoid causing this harm to the waterway? Normally, that would have applied here. However, um, a few years before, the Montana legislature had carved out an exemption from anti-degradation review into the Montana water quality statute. So this is the legislature stepping in and creating an exemption. And basically, they identified a certain class of activities that they characterized it as insignificant. And that included um, uh, these kind of monitoring well test discharges and basically said they're not subject to that anti-degradation review. As I talked about, usually when the legislature passes a law in a state, that's that's came over legally, right? Maybe a court might look at this and interpret the statute differently, but if the court agrees that, that's, that this activity falls within the exemption and that's what the statute says, um, that's it. The legislature gets set aside. Happily, because Montana had a Green Amendment, it wasn't game over. The, the court, Montana Supreme Court, looked at this and said, actually, in this case, if we were to, if this language in this statute adopted by the legislature was applied to allow a discharge um, and degradation of waters without any study of their impact or alternatives, et cetera, that would violate the Constitution. So as applied here, the exemption to the statute to anti degradation review that the Montana legislature adopted violates the Green Amendment uh, in Montana's constitution, which is an extraordinarily, that's the kryptonite, right? So usually if the legislature passes a statute, your only tool as a citizen is to try to get a different legislature, try to get it undone. As we all know, that's a very tricky, long process. Um, uh, but here the Green Amendment provided um, an opportunity to examine a decision, kind of an exemption from a really strong protective uh, build protective of water quality that had been kind of snuck in under the public radar, bring it to public light, um, and not allow it to be used to exploit, and not allow it to be used um, uh, to uh, uh, cause environmental harm. And I will say, with respect to the fate of the mine, 
Montana's, Montanans actually voted in 1998 through a citizens initiative to phase out open pit cyanide leach mining altogether in Montana. The second case I want to talk about, which is uh, ongoing, actually has the same uh, name, so we'll call it number two, Montana Environmental Information Center versus Department of Environmental Quality um, uh, number, uh, number two. This is a case involving the construction of a methane gas um, power station, the Laurel Generating Station. So this is a generating station that would um, have 18 internal combustion engines. Um, it would require, each of those requires a 77 foot tall exhaust stack. It would generate when operated almost 800,000 tons per year of greenhouse gases. Um, Montana has an environmental review statute that requires agencies before they issue a permit, this, this facility would require an air permit to consider the environmental impacts. Here, the Montana Department of Environmental Quality issued a permit, an air permit to the Laurel Generating Station without considering the impact of the carbon dioxide emissions of the plant um, on climate change and Montana. And in April, a district court held that that environmental review was inadequate uh, under Montana's environmental review statute. Unfortunately, but the legislature then stepped in and amended Montana's Environmental Policy Act to specifically exempt consideration of greenhouse gas emissions in this way. Usually in a state that doesn't have a green amendment, this would be game over unless you can get a different legislature um, uh, uh, um, uh, voted uh, into office, there would be the timeline wouldn't be right, the station would be built, it would be operating, etc. Um, happily, um, Montana does have a green amendment. Um, and so although the because of the statutory change, the court has said, okay, I'm going to stay my decision. Um, the, the, um, uh, but um, there's an opportunity now for the plaintiffs to challenge whether the exemption carving out greenhouse gas emissions from environmental review in Montana violates the Montana Constitution. That's an open question. That's a case that we'll move forward and I think you'll hear about later. But again, it's a possibility um, to, you know, um, it's a legal tool that can be used to challenge uh, a, poor a poor legislative uh, decision that's potentially at odds uh, with our environmental, uh, environmental rights. Thank you for your time and attention. I'm happy to take questions by email and happy Green Amendments Day. And so we didn't get any questions directly on this presentation. So Mel and I decided we would just go right to the next to the next um, video. Um, and yes, do just want to acknowledge for those we do apologize. Um, um, Professor Q's uh, audio was a little bit off. She was in a little bit of a different difficult place when it came to internet. Um, but I hope, you know, and appreciate that you all really listened intently, which was clear from the trap because, you know, the message she had to deliver was really well worth that extra hard listen. But I did want to just let you know, we don't have that problem with the other videos coming up. So the next presentation is going to be by Mark Freed. He also is in private practice, but a lot of his work is representing municipalities, environmental organizations, and individuals who are really working hard to better protect our environment. And he's done quite a bit of work with Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania's Green Amendment. So now this is the case he's going to talk about is a little bit complicated, but the outcome and the message is very, very important in terms of uh, the amendment, a Green Amendment applying to all government officials. So let's have Mark take it away. Uh, my name is Mark Freed. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Curtin and Hefner, and I'm here to speak to you today about a recent decision issued by the Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania related to the Pennsylvania Utility Commission and a uh, local government. People often focus on environmental agencies like DEP or DCNR as uh, trustees uh, under the Environmental Rights uh, Amendment. Um, in fact, Pennsylvania Supreme Court has made clear that the trustee obligation under the amendment applies um, to all agencies of the Commonwealth and its municipal subdivisions, including local governments. Uh, this was recently illustrated in a case that was issued by the Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania on March 9th, 2023, that involved the Public Utility Commission and Marple Township. 
Uh, for those who don't know, the Commonwealth Court is one of the intermediate appellate courts in Pennsylvania that generally hears government-related matters. Uh, for those interested in the citation, the case is Township of Marple versus Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission, 294 a 3rd 965. This case touches on the issue of preemption, which sometimes arises in environmental rights amendment cases. The Pennsylvania Municipality Planning Code, which is often known as the MPC, is the state law that generally governs how local governments handle zoning and land use determinations. Oftentimes, structures regulated by the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission, or PUC, are exempted from local zoning and land use approval. However, the MPC expressly provides that municipalities may regulate by way of local ordinance, the location of a building that a public utility wishes to build or use, unless the public utility commission decides that the present or proposed situation of the building in question is reasonably necessary for the convenience and welfare of the public. So essentially this is an exception to the preemption rule. Uh, and then there's an exception to the exception. This has generally been viewed as a relatively lax standard for a public utility to establish that uh, they should be exempt from local regulation. It has been found that in order to obtain a determination that a building is reasonably necessary for the convenience and welfare of the public, the public utility must show that it has made a reasonable decision, not the best possible decision. In this case, the Public Utility Commission approved a petition by Pico Energy Company asking that two buildings proposed as part of a gas reliability station in Marple Township be considered reasonably necessary for the convenience or welfare of the public. Specifically, PICO proposed building a station building and a fiber building. The station building was to be enclosed and provide weather protection for pipes, valves, regulators, and electronic equipment necessary for the operation of the station and provide climate control for the proper functioning of this equipment. The fiber building was to protect sensitive tele telecommunication equipment necessary to connect the station to PICO's control room and provide an enhanced aesthetic appeal. The PUC found that PICO met its burden of proving that the two buildings associated with the gas reliability station should be exempt from the township's zoning ordinance because the proposed situation of the buildings was reasonably necessary for the public convenience or welfare of the public. Although the township had raised concerns about potential explosions, noise, and emissions from the station's building, the commission, uh, when it, the commission determined that the environmental concerns were outside the purview of its review of the exemption. In addition, the commission said that even if it had the authority to consider these issues, it would defer the determination to those agencies with jurisdiction over environmental impacts, including the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. On appeal, the township argued that the commission erred by declining to consider the, the station's potential environmental impact on public health, safety, and welfare. The Commonwealth Court agreed with the township. And there's an important quote here that I think is, is worth reading because I think it encapsulates what the Commonwealth Court found uh, in this case. Um, among other things, relying on the Environmental Rights Amendment, the court found that the commission is obligated to consider, quote, the environmental impacts of placing a building at a proposed location while also deferring to environmental determinations made by other agencies with primary regulatory jurisdiction over the matters. Specifically, the court said a section 619 proceeding is constitutionally inadequate unless the commission completes an appropriately thorough environmental review of a building siting proposal. And in addition, factors the results into its ultimate determination regarding the reason reasonable necessity of the proposed siting. Here, however, the commission sidestepped this obligation and, though it stated it would defer to the other agency's determinations regarding environmental issues, failed to identify any such outside agency determinations that pertain to explosions, 
explosion impact radius, noise, or heat or emissions. The commission's deference in this context thus appears to have been nothing more than an illusory, been nothing more than illusory and its environmental review substantially non-existent. This failure renders the decision entirely deficient from a constitutional standpoint. And that was a quote from the Commonwealth Court. The court vacated the commission's decision and remanded the matter to the commission with instructions that it issue an amended decision regarding the PICO petition, which must incorporate the results of a constitutionally sound environmental impact review as to the proposed siting of the property of the fiber building and the station building. While it's unclear how the PUC will address the matter on remand, one thing does seem clear. It is not enough for an agency to refuse to undertake its constitutional obligation to consider environmental impacts of a proposal. Although this case addressed the decision of a state commission, the rationale could be particularly impactful for local governments, which often defer environmental considerations to state and county agencies. Thank you very much. Great. So I just now we just wanted to highlight one thing before we go on to the next case, if that's okay. Um, you know, one of the things that you heard Mark talk about is that the Green Amendment obligations in the Pennsylvania Green Amendment apply to the Public Utilities Commission. Often people get very frustrated with public utility commissions because they feel like there isn't really a place or space for people to be heard, particularly when it comes to environmental issues. So this makes clear that there actually is um, an obligation on the PUC, which really does open up a space for, for the people. But the other really important point that I wanted to highlight in this case, and also that you heard John Smith talk about um, in the Act 13 case, that green amendments are not just being used by private individuals and environmental organizations to defend natural resources and environmental rights. We actually have government officials who are using the green amendment language to protect their own authority and obligation to protect the natural resources within their purview for the benefit of their constituents, their communities, including both present and future generations. So just wanted to highlight that, right? We have, we do have individuals, we do have organizations who rely on these green amendments for better protections, but we also have government officials that are turning to the green amendments to allow them to better protect the environments that they care about and that they are responsible to protect for their communities and constituents. So just wanted to highlight that. And I think the next intro is yours, Mel. Okay, awesome. Um, now I'd like to introduce attorney Yvonne Norman, a civil litigator and environmental justice advocate who serves environmental justice and the public interest in many respects and capacities. So let's listen to her presentation about an important New York case. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a real pleasure to be here today in celebration of National Green Amendment Day. My name is Yvonne Norman. I am a civil litigator and environmental justice advocate. I am here to talk to you about the transformational effect of New York State's Green Amendment. My focus is on the two seminal cases that set the framework for its interpretation. Fresh air for the east side versus the state of New York and fresh air for the east side versus town of Perrington. But before I dive into the facts and collective rulings in these cases, I would like to offer some background. New York State's Green Amendment, which became effective on January 1, 2022, is codified as Section 19 of Article 1 in our Bill of Rights, as follows. Environmental rights. Each person shall have a right to clean air and water and a healthful environment. A very simple yet incredibly powerful phrase. And I just cannot emphasize enough that the significance of having a constitutional environmental protection is that our lives literally depend on it. In other words, the right to clean air, clean water, and a healthy environment is not being created by the Constitution, but rather is being protected as inherent in our human nature. Now, the question that is being asked by many is, does it really make a difference? And the answer is a solid yes. The fresh air for the East Side cases demonstrate this in a number of ways. The plaintiff in these cases is a nonprofit organization, Fresh Air for the East Side, or FAFI, 
acting on behalf of the residents of Monroe and Wayne counties. The lawsuits involved the High Acres landfill located in the towns of Perrington and Massillon. The landfill is about 1,200 acres, receiving approximately 3,500 daily tons of solid waste and has been the source of over 26,000 complaints from the community since 2017, related to sickening and nauseating odors and gases. FAFI had experts conduct studies that detected fugitive greenhouse gas emissions and air pollutants, including methane and sulfur compounds. FAFI had been advocating on behalf of the community for several years to no avail. Their efforts included petitions to the Department of Environmental Conservation, which is the regulatory body in the state, as well as prior lawsuits in efforts to remedy the situation. Those pre amendment lawsuits alleged that the operation of the landfill constituted a nuisance as well as violations of the Clean Air Act. But those lawsuits did not survive initial motions to dismiss by the state defendants for failure to state a claim and lack of standing. But FAFI did not give up. In January of 2022, FAFI brought a declaratory judgment and injunctive relief action, not seeking monetary damages, but seeking to either shut down the landfill or abate the fugitive emissions by covering the exposed non-active sections of the landfill. Among these claims, FAFI asserted violations of the Green Amendment rights of the community. The case was brought in the Monroe County Supreme Court, which in New York is a trial level court, not our highest court. The defendants are the state of New York and the Department of Environmental Conservation, DC, as regulatory bodies charged with oversight and enforcement of the landfill permit. Waste Management of New York, a private company which owns and operates the landfill, and the city of New York, as it is estimated that currently 90% of the solid waste comes from New York City. As suspected, all defendants quickly moved to dismiss. However, this time, FAFI defeated the initial motions to dismiss by the state defendants. The actions against New York City and waste management were dismissed. The companion case is an Article 78 proceeding against the town of Farrington, alleging that the town violated a number of state laws, town code provisions, and notably that it violated the Green Amendment by approving the landfill permit. The motions to dismiss in that case were also denied, and the Article 78 petition remains pending. In deciding these first impression challenges, the Monroe County Court made a number of rulings that have set a precedent for interpretation of New York's Green Amendment. First, the Green Amendment is self-executing, meaning it does not require any further action by the legislature because neither the legislature nor an executive agency can define constitutional rights. Second, the Green Amendment is not enforceable against private companies. It is only enforceable against the state and governmental agencies. Third, the state has a non-discretionary duty to comply with the Constitution, including the environmental rights now protected under Section 19 of the Bill of Rights. Fourth, the Green Amendment is not retroactive, meaning it does not apply to decisions or events prior to its adoption in January of 2022. A subsequent case is consistent on this point. Marty versus the City of New York was a declaratory judgment action in which residents in Lower Manhattan asserted violations of the Green Amendment seeking to stop a housing development alleging an increase in air pollution. However, that challenge had already been denied in February of 2021 so the court in that case found that the Green Amendment could not be retroactively applied. Fifth, a Green Amendment claim does not require a plaintiff to exhaust administrative remedies, meaning there is no condition precedent or preliminary procedure required before going to a trial court with a constitutional challenge under the Green Amendment. Sixth, the standard for judicial review of a Green Amendment claim is more rigorous than an administrative, arbitrary, and capricious standard. This essentially has shifted the burden of proof onto the government to establish that it is not infringing upon a constitutional right. Seventh, the court suggested a two-pronged test when analyzing Green Amendment claims. First, did the government action comply with the applicable statute? And second, did the government action violate a person's constitutional right to clean air and water and a healthy environment? Eighth, the court ruled that the proper relief is a declaratory judgment that a constitutional right has been violated and must be remedied. Though the court recognized that there are limits as to what the court can or should do under a Green Amendment claim. The ultimate question is whether or not the state or agency comply with the Constitution. For instance, in FAFI, the plaintiff had demanded the immediate closure of the landfill or installation of a permanent cover on the inactive section. 
and the court did not order either of these reliefs. In practice, the FAFI rulings mean that the Green Amendment allows holding a state accountable with the strength of a constitutional challenge, and the state is now compelled to give environmental claims more serious consideration. The Green Amendment has also provided plaintiffs with an avenue to assert substantive environmental rights and obtain a remedy, a burden that the FAFI plaintiffs were not able to overcome for years prior to the enactment of the Green Amendment in 2022. So it is clear that the Green Amendment in New York has indeed had a transformational effect in protecting environmental rights. With that in mind, it is counterintuitive that only three states, Montana, Pennsylvania, and now New York, out of 50, have constitutional environmental protections. Certainly more can and should be done across the nation. As litigation asserting Green Amendment claims continues, we will see how its interpretation and implementation evolves and how environmental constitutional challenges shape future governmental decisions, especially those impacting environmental justice communities. Thank you, Maya, and your team for the opportunity to participate on this incredible panel today. So I think that Yvonne was so clear and compelling that everybody understood everything. She's just really a, a powerhouse. So I think that we will go right on being mindful of time. Um, and our next video is going to come from Casey Manahan, who is the senior attorney at the Delaware Riverkeeper Network and has done a lot of work with regards to Pennsylvania's Green Amendment. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Green Amendment Day. My name is Casey Manahan. I'm an attorney with Delaware Riverkeeper Network. And I'm here to talk with you today about Montana's Green Amendment, which is here up on the screen. Uh, and an important case interpreting that amendment called Park County Environmental Council versus Montana Department of Environmental Quality, also known as the Lucky Minerals case. Uh, the citation for that case is 477 P. 3rd, 288, and that's Montana Supreme Court 2020. So this particular case is about Lucky Minerals, which is a private, privately owned company uh, that sought an exploration license from Montana's Department of Environmental Quality, also known as the DEQ, um, so that they could drill on their privately owned property to see if there were minerals there that they could mine. Um, and this, it would not only involve drilling on the property, but it would also involve the improvement of an access road through a wilderness um, area that included uh, grizzly bears and wolverines, which are both endangered species. So this permit or this license was uh, issued under the Metal Mine Reclamation Act uh, by the DEQ, and DEQ was also required to comply with the Montana Environmental Policy Act, the, also known as MEPA, which is similar to uh, the federal statute National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA. Both statutes uh, require agencies to prepare environmental impact statements detailing the impacts of permits that they're going to issue or other actions that they're going to take. Um, and an alternative to an environmental impact statement is an environmental assessment and a finding of no significant impact. Um, so if, if there's no significant environmental impact resulting from an activity, then you don't need to prepare an EIS. So in this case, what happened was that um, the DEQ prepared a environmental assessment, concluded there was no significant impact as a result from these exploration activities and issued the license to Lucky Minerals. The plaintiffs in this case, which were the Park County Environmental Council and the Greater Yellowstone Coalition, challenged uh, that license in court, alleging that that uh, DEQ failed to consider uh, groundwater impacts associated with drilling, as well as <clears throat> impacts to the habitat for the wolverine and the grizzly bear uh, caused by improving the access road. Because if the access road were improved, then uh, other people could use it and introduce people, human beings, into an area that they previously weren't uh, able to access, and that would impact the habitat. So um, this was challenged in Montana's district court, which is their trial court level. And the district court did determine that DEQ failed to take a hard look at these impacts. Um, so the remedy that it, it provided was to remand or to send the the uh, MEPA analysis back to DEQ to do it again. Um, so if this were the sole remedy uh, that plaintiffs were able to get, then Lucky would have kept its license and it would have been able to perform these actions regardless of what was going on at DEQ and their analysis of um, these impacts. So basically the impacts would be happening as they were being analyzed. So uh, what the plaintiffs did in this case were was that they 
made a motion before the district court to vacate the license, meaning to set it aside as if it never existed, uh, which at the time uh, under the 2011 amendments to, Me to MEPA was prohibited. Those uh, amendments provided that the only remedy for a violation of MEPA was to remand that analysis back to the agency. And basically that any permit that was issued um, after after a faulty MEPA analysis was allowed to live on and, and the permit would be still effective for the permit holder. So the district court um, concluded that this actually, this 2011 amendment was unconstitutional because it it was uh, did not provide an adequate remedy as required, as you can see here in uh, the Mont Montana Green Amendment language. It did, did not provide an adequate remedy, which is required by the constitution. So the, the key language here, you know, it was appealed to the Supreme Court um, and uh, DEQ actually before the Supreme Court admitted that it did not take a good enough look at these impacts and asked just for a remand. Um, but the Attorney General of Montana, as well as Lucky Minerals, the, the company that owned the license, uh, argued that the, the permit should not, or the license had, should not have been vacated. Um, and in this case, basically this, what the Supreme Court tells us about the Montana Green Amendment are three important things. Uh, first, it's preventative in nature. Um, so the the state's duties under the Green Amendment include preventing environmental harm. Second, the state is obligated to provide adequate remedies for infringement of of environmental rights. And third, that um, it it explained a little bit more the relationship between environmental rights and private property rights, which we'll get to later. So, the key language here from the Supreme Court is that Article 9, Section 1 of the Montana Constitution guarantees that the government will provide Montanans with remedies adequate to prevent unreasonable degrad degradation of their natural resources. This guarantee includes the assurance that the government will not take actions jeopardizing such unique and treasured facets of Montana's natural environment without first thoroughly understanding the risks involved. So again, Montana's Green Amendment is forward-looking and preventative, not just remedying environmental harm after the fact. State government has to prevent this harm and provide adequate remedies, which means that they will prevent degradation that may infringe, infringe on environmental rights. Um, in this case, uh, the, the remedy needs to be equitable in nature, um, which means you know, courts can provide either equitable remedies, which are telling someone to do something, telling someone not to do something. Uh, I kind of think of it as having a real world effect, um, an order, right? You have to do this or you have to, or you can't do that. And in this case, it would be you can't, this permit can't be issued. Uh, a legal remedy, which is the other kind of the opposite of an equitable remedy is awarding someone uh, money for something. You know, we, we hear about this often in the news. Someone did something wrong to another person, so they have to pay them millions of dollars, right? So that's that's a typical legal remedy. Um, so because MEPA here was enacted to meet the state's constitutional obligations without the, the ability to provide equitable remedies, like the vacature of this, um, of this license, MEPA errors would be essentially irreversible. Uh, and other statutes that help uh, enforce mining regulations, things like that, don't exactly do what MEPA does here, which is kind of the look before you leap, right? It, it makes the state look at the environmental impacts before they happen. Um, and, you know, that's that's an important step. It's required by the Constitution. And the courts need to be able to prevent that action from being taken if the, if the state hasn't looked <laughs> before it left. Um, so then the next question was, you know, obviously this, the 2011 MEPA amendments, which prevent this type of remedy were unconstitutional, or they infringed on environmental rights. So what level of scrutiny should they be subject to? Uh, scrutiny, levels of scrutiny is a concept in constitutional law. That means, you know, when something has, when a state action has been found to infringe on a right, any, any right, not just environmental rights, uh, the court needs to decide, well, was that action lawful regardless? Um, there's you know, in federal constitutional law, there's strict scrutiny, intermediate scrutiny, and rational basis. And those are, that's kind of the level it goes in. Um, and here, the, this court really only dealt with strict scrutiny and then an alternative theory, uh, which was presented by the Montana Attorney General. So strict scrutiny means uh, that any law or action that infringes on a right must be narrowly tailored to further a compelling government interest. And that's a very difficult test to pass. It means that there has to be a really good reason, an extremely good reason for infringing on the right. And then the means of infringing on that right have to be as limited as possible to uh, meet that really good reason. Um, the attorney general in this case argued that, well, here the lucky mining or lucky, yeah, lucky minerals here has some private property interests in mining their property, and so therefore you have to balance those environmental rights with the with the private property rights. But uh, the Supreme Court here said, well, there might be a situation 
where those two rights have an irreconcilable conflict. And in that case, it might be appropriate for the state to have to engage in a kind of balancing analysis. But because, <clears throat> because uh, Lucky Mining's use of its private property is subject to regulation, which you know all, all of us are subject to regulation in different areas of our lives. Those of us who are property owners are probably familiar with some of those regulations. Um, but you know, state regulations for the public health and safety and welfare, uh, they don't infringe on rights the same way um, that other infringements, you know, to a constitutional level. So um, not only was that was its right subject to regulation, but here it was also depending on a valid permit. And because the court found that the permit was invalidly issued, that property right never really materialized. So in this case, the court found that strict scrutiny was the appropriate level of uh, evaluation. And no party in this case really argued that the 2011 amendments to MEPA met that test. So the, the amendments were declared unconstitutional, which means they were, and in this case, they were declared facially unconstitutional, unconstitutional, which means they would be unconstitutional in every circumstance. So again, this Lucky Minerals case kind of tells us about Montana Montana's Green Amendment, its preventative nature, uh, the state's obligation to provide adequate remedies, and how uh, environmental, environmental rights relate to private property rights. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you guys have a great day. I guess I'm going to continue in the theme of Montana. And um, I'm not going to share any slides, so you have my face to look at as soon as it comes back on the screen. But um, so Montana, Held v. State of Montana, some of you have seen it in the news lately. Um, it's a youth-led constitutional lawsuit. In 2020, 16 young people from across the state of Montana, represented by Our Children's Trust, Western Environmental Law Center, and McGarvey Law, asserted that supporting a fossil fuel-driven energy system, which is proven to be con contributing to the climate crisis, is violating their constitutional rights to a clean and healthful environment, to seek safety, health, and happiness, and to individual dignity and equal protection of the law. So as, as you saw in uh, Casey's presentation, the Montana Constitution states in its Declaration of Rights, Article 2, all persons are born free and have certain inalienable rights. They include the right to clean and healthful environment. So many cases uh, have combined with this provision um, Another provision in the Constitution, in their Constitution, Article 9, uh, Environment and Natural Resources. Section 1, subsection 1, provided the state and each person shall maintain and improve. So the state and each person shall maintain and improve a clean and healthful environment in Montana for present and future generations. Those are glowing words. So um, as you have heard so far, especially in the last case you just heard, um, the jurisprudence on these matters have developed pretty well over time in Montana. And so the question becomes, do the youth plaintiffs have a right to expect their government to, according to excerpts from youthvgov.org, quote, protect the airs, waters, wildlife, and public lands threatened by drought, heat, fires, smoke, and floods. So does it apply to the climate crisis? Uh, as, as many of you know, the youth plaintiffs are not seeking money, but declaratory relief that Montana's fossil fuel energy policies and actions violate their state constitutional rights. The youth plaintiffs also argue that the fossil fuel energy system is degrading and depleting Montana's constitutionally protected public trust resources, including the atmosphere, rivers and lakes and fish and wildlife. So it should be considered unconstitutional to continue exploiting fossil fuels. Rather, it should stay in the ground and the state of Montana should transition to clean energy no later, no later than 2050. So a quick overview of the case's procedural history that for me is pretty interesting. Um, so the case was filed in 2020, the state of Montana moved to dismiss arguing that one, youth plaintiffs did not have standing because the youth plaintiffs could establish neither causation nor redressability. Two, the requested relief presented a political question and was therefore non-justiciable. And three, 
youth plaintiffs fail to exhaust their administrative remedies before filing suit. These are all very familiar for any practitioner within the, <laughs> the fun field of environmental law. Um, a year later in August of 2021, the first judicial district court ruled in favor of the youth plaintiffs that they could proceed to trial, denying the state's motion to dismiss. Here are uh, a few of the key findings that were provided by the court important. Uh, with, with regard to standing, injury was undisputed. A claim of causation was supported by a demonstration that Montana itself is responsible for significant carbon emissions contributing to climate change. Also, the existence of contributing emissions from other states did not negate the potentially contributing causation of Montana. Next, declaratory relief, including a declaration that implicated statutory provisions are unconstitutional on environmental rights grounds, could remove in whole or in part or correct the injuries being claimed, thereby providing a meaningful remedy and fulfilling the requirement of redressability. And then finally, plaintiffs have the ability to bring a direct action to court to enforce environmental rights. Administrative exhaustion is not required. Um, I'm gonna fast forward just a bit for, for time purposes, but um, as you may know, um, last month over the course of two weeks, the trial was heard. Uh, the case was heard by trial um, in Montana. I, I was personally only able to tune in for portions of it, but Maya was able to attend the entire thing if anyone has any questions for her later on about that. Uh, but according to youthvgov.org, uh, from June 12th through the 20th, youth plaintiffs, their attorneys, and world-renowned experts from across Montana and the United States presented clear, irrefutable evidence that, and then there are four points. One, Montana is promoting the extraction and burning of fossil fuels despite the availability of renewable energy resources. I'm sorry, renewable energy sources. Two, extracting and burning fossil fuels causes and worsens the climate crisis. Three, the climate crisis injures and harms the youth plaintiffs. And four, these climate injuries and harms caused by the actions of their own government violate the, the youth's state constitutional rights. So it will surely be interesting to see how the court rules. And while we're all waiting for bated breath for the opinion, we're also expecting an appeal by whichever side does not prevail. Um, but it will be a very important Green Amendment case to, to keep tabs on. So with that, I'm gonna go back to Maya for an overall wrap up. No, we're not quite at wrap up. <laughs> well, wrap up on the cases. Quasi wrap up. Quasi wrap up. Yep. So, um, you know, as we've heard, right, that there have been some really incredible legal successes um, using the Green Amendments in New York and Pennsylvania and Montana. But what you've heard is really just a short list of the successes that have been achieved in the courtroom. There's a second short list that I've put on the right side of this of this screen. I mean, green amendments in these states have been used in really powerful ways. They've been used in Pennsylvania to secure cleanup of a long ignored toxic site in a toxic condition for decades where DEP was doing nothing to hold responsible parties accountable to clean it up. But because of the Pennsylvania Green Amendment, now action is being taken to, to clean it up. The Green Amendment has been used to prevent the misappropriation of environmental protection funds by government officials. It was used to protect the state of Montana from having to enforce force a development deal, which if that deal went forward because of test well drilling for drinking water supplies that would have been required, um, the entire town of of Bozeman's drinking water supply could have become contaminated, but the state was able to use the Green Amendment to protect themselves from having to enforce that private deal and thereby protect the drinking water aquifer of the entire town of Bozeman. And very recently, the Green Amendment has been used in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to prevent a ban on fracking from being overturned by a handful of politically motivated legislators. And that's just another short list. Um, if you go to forthegenerations.org backslash resources link is in the chat you'll find write-ups of these cases and more 
Um, but so I hope you you're really being convinced that the Green Amendment does make a difference. But the Green Amendment, you know, in these states isn't just making a difference in the courtroom. In fact, one of the most powerful values of a Green Amendment is to get better government decisions that avoid harm. So we avoid harming natural resources, we avoid harming people, and we avoid having to go into the courtroom. Pennsylvania, the governor used the Pennsylvania Green Amendment to support some of the most protective drinking water standards, um, what are called MCLs from PFAS contamination just this past year. The Pennsylvania Attorney General routinely cites the Pennsylvania Green Amendment in enforcement actions. And we also are seeing municipalities at the local level turn to the Green Amendment to engage in better government decision making to protect natural resources for their constituents. And so to just prove that point, we're going to hear now from Michael Molinaro. He is a commissioner in um, Marple Township in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And he is going to talk about how the commissioners in his community use the Pennsylvania Green Amendment to save what is known as the Don Guanella Woods from irreparable devastation and harm. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Molinaro. I'm a uh, commissioner in Marple Township, Delaware County, Pennsylvania. In case you're not familiar with the matter, uh, we had a very large tract of uh, some 200 plus acres called Don Guanella, uh, which was subject to uh, development. And fortunately, uh, that development did not occur. Having lived in Marple Township for over 50 years, I remember the cornfields on Paxton High Road the open space, an old-fashioned water well at the now Marple Commons, a few log cabins, the bird dog track, the barn on the hog property, and all the other open lands throughout the township, which have now been transformed to open space, office space, shopping centers, and houses. I have vivid memories of walking the creeks, turning rocks for salamanders, and biking at the Don Guanella track, finally known to the locals as the farm. And that is because there was an old farm there farmhouse there which is somewhat in disrepair but need, needless to say there was a farmhouse it is difficult to believe that the St. Peter and Paul Cemetery Monument which used to stand on the property was somehow intended to be a pole sign for a massive development I personally think we have enough we have taken enough and it's time to stop in reviewing the township's comprehensive plan uh, the plan did not contemplate the development of Don Guanella, and to the contrary, the open space of the entire Don Guanella property, as well as the adjacent St. Peter and Paul Cemetery, are noted as a percentage of open space uh, in the Township Comprehensive Plan. The decision is simple. Raise and raise, cut, clear, and destroy for the profits of a few, or conserve, preserve, and protect for the profits of many. The Don Guanella track could never be replaced once the forest, trails, and vegetation, wildlife, and marine life are gone. There is no replacement. They would forever be gone. The clear cutting of the existing forest, mature canopy, and other vegetation can never be replaced or repaired. They too are forever gone. The displacement of the local wildlife can never be replaced. They as well forever be gone. The natural flow and evolution of the waterways and ecosystem will forever be polluted, destroyed, and altered. Development of this property would have forever affected the aesthetics wind patterns, sight lines, trash, light, and noise pollution in our township. This is truly one of the last forests we have in our township and county, and we continue to have a fiduciary duty to protect it. My interpretation of protecting all of the above mentioned is that as an elected official, we have a duty under the Pennsylvania Constitution and Environmental Rights Amendment to protect and preserve the Commonwealth's natural resources. After all, if we don't protect them, who's going to protect them? 
we all have a right to clean air, pure water, and to the preservation of the natural, scenic, historical, and aesthetic values of the environment. Pennsylvania's public natural resources are the common property of the people, including those people for the generations to come. As elected officials, we must stand as the trustees of these resources and conserve and maintain them for the benefit of all the people and generations to come. I also believe that it is morally our obligation and duty as elected officials to indefinitely protect all open space, woodlands, wildlife, and waterways for today, tomorrow, and the future. The protection of townships natural resources and features, open space resources, and historic heritage will continue to remain a high priority for the commissioners of Marble Township. We as elected officials need to set the standard for conservation and stewardship for others to follow. As I said before, if we don't do it, who's going to do it? I am proud to say that the Don Guadalupe track will be there forever for all generations to enjoy, and I applaud all of those individuals and organizations who stood to protect the forest. To quote Joni Mitchell, they took all the trees and put them in the tree museum, and they charged the people a dollar and a half to see them. Don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you've got till it's gone. They've paid paradise and put up a parking lot. Not in our town. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the summer. Stay cool. And enjoy your favorite open spaces. So that was really great. Um, so Mel, I know we've been going a little bit long, but I think people are really excited about the great information. We have two outstanding questions. So how about I ask you the first one? So Joan Deaver asks, how does the Green Amendment provide recourse for citizens, public officials, and or environmental organizations in cases where a private company may be doing environmental damage? Well, the quick answer is it depends <laughs> because the um, it's much easier to um, use a Green Amendment against direct action by a private entity or perhaps um, a contractual provision uh, that, that's at stake regarding its constitutionality against the Green Amendment. Um, based on the, uh, the, the way a Green Amendment is worded. So in, I think, I think Hawaii spe specifies private. Um, I'm not sure, you can, you can answer that part. Not an expert on, on everything else outside of Florida, but the, uh, I know that there was a, uh, a case um, that had to do with a private um, a private contract where uh, something was brought up. And, and the bottom line is that the, the provision at stake that unreasonably or, or just violated the rights of, you know, of the, of, of um, the plaintiffs to their, you know, to clean and healthful environment was seen as an unconstitutional provision. So um, it was a, a violation of the rights. So it can reach in different ways of uh, private action. And I can tell you in Florida, we were made to ensure that the drafting based, I can, that, that's a whole other session, but we, the, the amendment is able to sue government entities in, uh, if they are a state executive agency. So we can't use the amendment particularly for um, private action for a couple of reasons. One, it's, you know, it probably bust the single subject rule that's, that's Florida's case law history. Um, two, we don't really need to because one, the, the, there is plenty of law that, of, that covers private actors and there, in, I would say plenty of law in Florida that covers pollution and, and, and destructive things that private entities do. The issue in Florida is that it's all state, state san sanctioned, it's permitted. And that's, the, that's kind of the, 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 the barrier that people have been bouncing off of when they're trying to advocate for better policy making or, or be better um, decisions that, that would prevent those types of perm permits. So 
Um, that's in, in Florida, at least, that is the aim of our Green Amendment is to hold the state accountable for their permitting, for their sanctioning of these private actions, for their um, policies of inaction, like not enough monitoring, not enough investigation or enforcement that's within their job, within their duties, but they're not doing it. So a Green Amendment could wrap around and, uh, um, and take care of all actors in the state um, through this through government action. So um, I hope I answered that question. Okay. So and I just want to yeah, I thought I'd quickly add on, Mel. Um, and that that really just reflect back on the Lucky Minerals mining case that you just heard about, or the Fathy case. In those cases, it was about government issuing a permit that was going to allow industry or others to take actions. And that the, the, the issuance of the permit, how that permit was decided upon, the elements it had, how it was or was not enforced, that is, that is why that private entity was allowed to undertake those activities. And so the challenge was against the government decision that allowed for the permit, that allowed the private industry to take that action. In the Act 13 case you heard about, we def by defeating that law, we prevented all of the oil and gas operations and fracking that would have flowed from the passage of that law. So that's really how you get to the private actors. You look to the government action that is legalizing or validating the private entity harm that's going to result in a constitutional violation and you challenge the government action as being a failure to fulfill their constitutional obligation to protect the environmental rights of the people and the natural resources of the state. Um, and just, I see Joan, you asked a, an additional question asking about how outside of the courtroom people can use the amendment. I would just you know, encourage you to go back to the Don Guanella Wood story, right? The reason why the Marple Township commissioners ultimately ruled the way they did in very significant part in, in, in reliance on the Pennsylvania Green Amendment. It's actually one of the stories that I write about in the book because it's so compelling, is the people use their advocacy, their voices to um, champion their own environmental rights to pure water, clean air, and a healthy environment, and urge the commissioners to embrace their constitutional obligation to re reject the development project in order to protect the Don Guanella Woods. And that is really how you use a Green Amendment outside of a courtroom. You use it in your advocacy to remind your government officials that they have this constitutional obligation. And unlike other laws and regulations where those government officials can kind of ignore you because ultimately they're usually the ones that define those laws and whether or not and or how they're interpreted or implemented. When it comes to the constitution, it is a right of the people. And they, they actually have a higher duty of care um, and, and know that. And so it becomes a lot harder for government officials to disregard a constitutional argument, a demand of the people for their right to a clean, safe, and healthy environment to be fully enforced and protected. And I think with that, Mel, we've um, we've got all the questions. Do you think that there's anything outstanding before we do the the real wrap up? I think we're ready to go. So. Um, just really, you know, again, want to thank everybody for coming today and investing this time to learn about how a Green Amendment really does bring transformational change. I want to thank Mel for joining me and co-hosting. She's a powerful advocate for the Green Amendment movement. Thank all of our attorneys for their presentations. Yvonne Norman, who did such a fantastic job. She's been on the program today um, and I'm sure enjoying it. Um, and I hope, again, that you really do see the power of this pathway for environmental protection and environmental rights moving forward. Um, Want to remind people, right, we've got action and activity in 18 states already. Pennsylvania, Montana, and New York have a Green Amendment, and the other 15 states up on the screen in green or yellow um, have Green Amendment proposals that are advancing or about to advance. But if you're interested, and we've been hearing about other states, people want to know, how do I get a Green Amendment movement started in your state? 
get in touch with me. Let's talk about how to make it happen. Some of our most powerful Green Amendment movements like in New Mexico and Maine started because one person saw a program like this, read the book, heard a radio show, and they literally picked up the phone and called me. And we started a conversation and made it happen. So if you wanna be the leader in your state, pick up the phone, call, send an email, and we'll connect up and start to work together. Um, meanwhile, ForTheGenerations.org is the website where you can get more information and resources. If you sign up for the Green Amendment Action app, you can go to the link or you can go to the app store on your phone and type in Green Amendments FTG um, and you'll find the app there and you can download it to your phone. It is phone friendly. Um, but we really hope that you will stay in touch and, and get engaged with us. Sign up for a free membership because um, we are constantly letting people know what's going on and how they can get involved. And of course, you can get a copy of, book, of the book to learn more about the message and help spread the word. Um, and with that, I really just want to thank you for joining us today to learn about how a Green Amendment makes transformational change. This is part of our Connecticut Green Amendment movement. I had the joy of being there um, earlier this year. They're really fantastic folks. And, you know, it really just shows how powerfully this pathway resonates with people because it really does make a difference, right? We're all trying to save the world and the Green Amendment movement is one way we can do that and very powerfully together. So thank you for joining us for National Green Amendment Day. Go forth and do good works. <laughs>